Hey, this is Phil Simon from the Huffington Post, and I'm very pleased today to be joined by one of my favorite musicians, Mr. John Wesley. John, how are you doing today? Good, Phil. Hope you're doing well. Good, good. Exciting stuff going on with you, man. Congratulations on the new album. Thank you very much. Can't wait for it to get out there. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about how it came about, and are you playing with some of the same people you played with on Lily Pad Suite? Actually, the team is almost exactly who was on Lily Pad Suite. I think the only difference is the bass player. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it had been coming around for a long time, uh, doing the porcupine tree stuff and uh, other things kind of kept me really busy. And then when Porcupine Tree got done, I went right back into trying to get this out. Um, Lilypad Suite was strange because we were actually working on this record hmm. when I had a chance to uh, open up for Marillion in Montreal on a big show, and we needed something to sell. And so I thought I I'd had been working on this little set of, of songs with kind of that theme acoustically, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll just slam this together as an acoustic album and put it out. And we started working on it, and it was like, man, this is so much more than a little acoustic EP. And then it became the Lily Pass. We really recorded that album in about three weeks. Hmm. And, uh, and uh, so the new one, uh, I started recording after that again. And it just went through a lot of changes, you know. Um, it went through a lot of changes, a lot of development. And uh, then when Porcupine Tree finally finished, um, I found myself finishing it again, and then I went out with Steve Wilson and toured with him, came back, and then life happened, man, and mm. just shut everything down for about two, well, about a year and a half. Uh, my wife was pregnant, and my mom was sick, and within a week, I had a baby, and my mom died, and then just, it was just like, within three days, you know. Mm. So it was this, and the baby was two months early. So all of this happened. I've got my wife and child in one hospital, my mom's in another hospital, and then, you know, so the album kind of stepped aside for about a year and a half. Right. I mean, sure. we would work on it, but it wasn't a focus. You know? Sure. With Disconnect, were there certain songs that came together more quickly than others? And if so, which ones were they? Well, as songs, all of them came together fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. What um, I wanted to really uh, take time was is how we treated the arrangement of the songs. So the songwriting itself really happens quickly. Um, it was the arrangement that went over several versions. Mm -hmm. uh, Once a Warrior actually came together really quickly. That just happened. And uh, I hadn't yet cut the solo section, and that's where you know, Alex came into that. But that one came together fairly quickly as an arrangement. And uh, Mary Will came together fairly quickly as an arrangement. But then again, saying that, we, we did the drum track twice. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, for the listeners who don't know, when you mentioned that Alex per performed a solo, um, yes. uh, I'm a big Rush fan. You're a big Rush fan. Uh, you t I, I don't watch that one interview you gave on, what was it, Prog World? Yes. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about how Alex came to contribute, because he also did a solo on uh, Anesthetize, right? Uh, yeah, on the Porcupine Tree album. Mm -hmm. um, basically, during that time period, uh, he came out to a show and we met. And we hung out all night, and he was great, and... We just hit it off right away. And um, shortly after that, I started writing with Neil. And, or maybe I'd already met Neil. I can't remember the exact timing. I, I think it was Alex first and then Neil. I can't remember. But anyway, um, and so when I was writing with Neil, I would see Alex at shows and we started hanging out. And after a few years, you know, he's like, well, what are you up to these days? And, like, well, you know, I'm trying to do this and that. He goes, well, if you ever want to do anything, let me know. And I was like, you know, whoa. And uh, then about two years later, actually this last August, when I was putting the finishing touches on the record, um, I was out riding with Neil, and Alex says, so what are you up to? I said, I'm finishing up my solo record. And he goes, save me a spot. And he's like, I think I have a spot for you. <laughs> Lucky for me, they finished the tour a couple of days later. He went home. I sent him the files a couple of weeks later, and he just slammed it right out, and it's mega. Yeah, that's one of the highlights on the album. You were kind enough to share a copy with me, uh, I guess about a month ago, and that one struck me, and uh, I tell you, the second I heard the first few um, chords of Get You Every Time, I was hooked on that one. That's a, that's a good one, isn't it? That's, that's a ripper. 
Cool, cool. And you're also going to be touring to support the album, right? And I was reading on Twitter that you'll be um, opening for Blackfield. Is it in New York? Yeah. Uh, it's Blackfield's last show with Steve Wilson. And it's going to be at the Best Buy Theater in New York on May 1st. And that's going to be our kind of our big coming out. So mm-hmm. that'll be a good one. Cool. And then hopefully there'll be some Northeast dates around that. And, you know, it's a slow burn, you know, coming out of Porcupine Tree and then doing this is like starting over. So getting agents and promoters, you know, the record isn't out yet. There's a buzz about it, but the record isn't out. People haven't heard it. It hasn't been reviewed. So to get agents and promoters to take a chance on you, is, uh, it's, it'll be a slow process, but it looks like it's going to happen. So. Mm-hmm. Well, this clearly isn't your first rodeo, and for the listeners and watchers of this video who don't understand, you actually have quite the interesting lineage beyond Rush. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, because um, I'm a big Marillion fan and I've interviewed some of the guys on Huffington Post before, but uh, you uh, you seem to sort of show up everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> I managed to make my way around. Um, yeah, I, I hooked up with the Marillion guys in the early 90s. You know, like I said earlier, I was kind of was broken looking for something to make some money. And I, uh, they had a guitar tech gig for a uh, United States tour opened up. And I had never guitar tech before, but I hopped on, gave it a shot. And uh, three days later, was the opening act. And I ended up opening over 350 shows with them on consequent world tours all over the world, South America, North America, Mexico, Scandinavia, just uh, Europe, everywhere. And uh, we obviously became great friends. Mark Kelly came over and produced uh, my first solo album, Hmm. um, which was released uh, primarily in Europe back then. And, you know, just maintained a long-term friendship, even till now, Steve Rutherford's, you know, and I... uh, just very close to the whole band. I think I've had every member except on the, on on an album at some point or another, other than Pete. Pete hasn't made an appearance yet, so I have to fix that. But, uh, <laughs> everyone's everyone's done something on something, even H signed track once. Well, this notion so, of uh, six degrees of separation and yeah. that, that game with Kevin Bacon—it's probably in the prog world two degrees, right? Yes, yeah, two degrees. I mean, and then uh, they. Fish was looking for a guitar player, and they recommended me to him, and I did three years playing the guitar for Fish, and wrote a record with him, and that's how I got to know Steve Wilson really well, and then when Steve needed uh, a little bit of heavy guitar on uh, the track Blackest Eyes for the first uh, Atlantic release, um, he emailed me the files to ask me if I could heavy that up, and so uh, a bunch of Les Paul and Marshall later, then he sent me some more tracks that could sing some backing vocals. So I sang backing vocals uh, on a couple other songs, that song and a few more. And then um, he decided he wanted to take an extra guitar player out uh, since they'd stepped up their game and was really, you know, Atlantic was going to give him a good push. Mm. And I went out and uh, played guitar with Porcupine Tree for the last uh, 10, 11 years. Mm-hmm. So. Was that uh, Black Asides, is that In Abstentia? The first, it's the opening track to In Abstentia, yeah. 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 Really good stuff, and hopefully uh, at some point there'll be a, a reunion tour with them, but uh, onward and upward. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll get you out of here with this. Uh, talk a little bit about the uh, video. I was checking it out, and you don't see too many videos these days from proper rock bands, but you uh, decided to buck the trend, huh? Yeah, um, the label, you know, they gave me a really, really, really small budget. So, you know, we liked to, a video, and, and uh, I'm not really an actor. <laughs> I was like, I told, I, I told the director, I was like, look, if you could... Uh, here, here's a little story. I'd read a science fiction novel years ago, and it kind of feeds into the theme of the album. And I think it was called The Memory Bank, or uh, yeah, something about The Memory Bank. It was about a guy who, uh, there was a place you can go in the future to erase certain memories. But if you did it too many times, it takes a toll and it wipes your brain out. Mm. Um, and so you're taking a risk, and he kind of goes into a, an off-record kind of back-alley memory bank. And uh, disconnects from some horrid memory. Hmm. And at the very end of the story, they play the memory for you. And you're like, I get it. You know, I see why he did it, why he'd risk it. And so we just kind of lightly incorporated that kind of visual into the, into the, into the video. So that was fun. Yeah, I thought they did a good job. You, you can't tell that it was performed on a small budget. In fact, I'm... Um, Absolutely, as I said before, no musician, but I do trailers for all my books, and oh. it's amazing with the tools now, the technologies, you can really stretch a small budget pretty far. Yeah, I mean, it was an amazingly small budget. I mean, all the models and actors, they, they worked to get it on their resumes, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, so it was, a, it was a great effort. It was, it was a lot of fun. You know, hey, it's not Beyonce, but uh, you know, 
<laughs> well, not yet. Well, hey, John, I appreciate your taking the time and best of luck with the album and the tour. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Great. This is Phil Simon for Huffington Post.